Thank you all for being with us at the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation Speaker Series. I'm Penny McPhee, the president of the foundation, and we are thrilled to welcome you this morning um, to our collaboration with the Cousins Foundation, Purpose Built Communities, and the Eastlake Foundations. There, the, the, I had the privilege of hearing Ian Galloway speak at the Purpose Built Conference in New Orleans about a month ago. And I was so impressed. This was the, really the first time that I had heard remarks about pay for success financing that were so clear and so compelling. And I immediately said to Lillian Giornelli, we need to invite Ian to Atlanta. And she said, well, we already have. So let's partner and, um, and bring him to our city. The, the Cousins Foundation's Purpose Built have been so instrumental in teaching all of us about community development and about how to create successful models that we couldn't find a more appropriate and better partner to bring a new idea to Atlanta. So we are very thrilled. Lillian, thank you and your team for being with us this morning. We are very thrilled to be your partners. This is a notion, this notion of social impact bonds and uh, pay for success financing that our foundation staff and several of our trustees have been interested in for a long time. But it's a little bit technical. It's a little bit complicated. We haven't known exactly how to present it to the community, how to um, really learn about it ourselves. So when I heard Ian, I thought, this is our perfect opportunity. Um, let's go for it. So we are delighted to have the rest of you wonks with us here this morning um, to learn about this. And I want to introduce Carol Naughton. Carol is the Senior Vice President of Purpose Built Communities. She's had a long history with East Lake and with the Cousins team. She really um, has given a lot of thought to a lot of innovations like this one. And it's my pleasure to introduce Carol to introduce our speaker. So thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Penny. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it is really my pleasure to be here uh, to introduce our friend Ian Galloway. Ian's a senior research associate at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Uh, he holds a master's degree in public policy from the University of Chicago, and even more importantly, an undergraduate degree in political science and philosophy from Colgate University. In 2010, he was named an, a future industry leader by the Opportunity Finance Network. He is published in a variety of areas. He is the author of Peer-to-Peer -Peer Lending and Community Development Finance and Charter School Tax Credit Investing in Human Capital. But what we know him from and where we have gotten to be friendly and uh, learn from him uh, was when he served as one of the primary editors of the book uh, called Investing in What Works for America's Communities, Essays on People, Place, and Purpose, which was published by the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank and the Low Income Investment Fund last year. That book has become known in uh, the community development world as the What Works book. Uh, and it really highlights things that are working to help families break the cycle of poverty across the country. Earlier this year, Ian served as the primary editor of an issue in the San Francisco Federal Reserve's uh, Community Development Investment Review. And that uh, issue focused on pay for performance financing. And it called together some of the very best thinking on how pay for success, pay for performance financing might work in this country and the kinds of things and problems that could be used to solve. For those of us who are in the social change business, uh, whether as members of the philanthropic, not-for-profit, or for-profit sectors, pay for success financing holds the promise of creating funding streams that will allow us to scale up and sustain work that produces real results. Um, but the exciting potential that uh, pay for success financing is tempered really by some pretty significant pitfalls that we need to understand before we would go down this pathway. It raises some serious questions that Ian will help us understand. Are we privatizing important government services that should remain under public control? How do we accurately measure and enforce success? Can we guard against fraud? Can we effectively balance our often conflicting goals of equity, efficiency, and efficacy? 
It will help us understand these questions, understand the model, and help us do a deep dive so we can begin that exploration here and hopefully come to some conclusions that will help us not only in Atlanta but around the country. So with that, we welcome Ian Galloway. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Carol, for that very nice introduction. Thank you, Penny and John, for hosting us today. Uh, and thank all of you for coming. This is uh, such a treat. I'm so happy to be out in Atlanta, uh, on my way to Boston, actually, this afternoon. So I uh, couldn't be happier. And actually, I'm from Portland, Oregon, so I brought the rain. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so I, as, as Carol mentioned, uh, my name is Ian Galloway. I'm a senior research associate in the community development uh, department at the San Francisco Fed. Um, which I think raises a really important question, why am I here? Uh, why is the Fed here? Why is the Fed interested in, in pay-for-success financing? Uh, so I, I thought I'd spend just a minute talking about our department uh, within the Fed and, and uh, its, its origins and, and some of our current research before pivoting and getting into uh, the, the, the bulk of my presentation, which will be on pay-for-success financing. Uh, so the reason that the Community Development Department exists uh, at the Federal Reserve, and it, uh, there is a community development department uh, here at the Atlanta Fed as well, uh, as well as the uh, other, uh, uh, all 12 uh, regional Federal Reserve banks that are scattered throughout the country and the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C. Uh, there's also a community development department uh, at, at the FDIC and the OCC. Uh, so if you're in your, in your respective community and you're interested in connecting with, uh, with your local regulator, I would encourage you uh, to reach out to uh, the community development department uh, at that particular regulator. The reason that the department exists is, is really rooted in the Community Reinvestment Act, which was passed in 1977. Uh, it was an anti-redlining uh, piece of legislation. Because at the time, banks uh, tended to take deposits out of low-income communities and then not lend them or invest them back into those communities uh, at a similar rate. Congress decided that was bad public policy. They passed the Community Reinvestment Act, the CRA. Um, but uh, at the time, banks uh, were, were deeply uncomfortable with this idea that they should be investing in low-income communities in markets that they didn't fully understand because there was a concern that that would endanger their safety and soundness, which uh, was, I think, a, a legitimate concern at the time. Uh, our departments were created to help banks understand uh, their role in low-income communities and invest safely in those communities. Uh, so the department was created, I think, in the early 80s. And we provided that support uh, and continue to, to provide that support uh, um, to banks. Uh, but the, the function has, has evolved over time as banks have gotten the hang of, of doing community development work in their, in their markets. Uh, so I'd say that, that we have evolved into um, sort of a think-and-do tank. Uh, that's, I'm borrowing a phrase from, from Alan Berube at, at the Brookings Institution. Uh, we, we have a, a, a research function, uh, so we publish regularly. Uh, the uh, journal that, that Carol mentioned uh, that, that we published on Pay for Success is an example of that. We also have uh, a, a regular magazine uh, and a uh, working paper series, and we publish uh, the occasional book and uh, uh, other similar works. Uh, we also hold convenings where we bring stakeholders together to solve uh, difficult community development challenges. Um, and we give public presentations on our research uh, to uh, people interested in it uh, around the country. Uh, that's the think side. Uh, the do side uh, is our field staff who um, are sort of our, our eyes and ears in the communities that we care about in our district. Uh, the 12th district, which is the geography that the San Francisco Fed oversees, uh, is comprised of, of the nine western states. You can see it's a big chunk of the population and the, uh, uh, the geography of, of the U.S. If you, if you go back in time and think about why that's the case, in 1913, not a lot of people lived over there. So uh, Congress decided that uh, that whole uh, western portion of the United States should go to the San Francisco Fed. And of course, since then, it's become uh, significantly larger in terms of population. Uh, so we, we oversee those nine western states. We have field staff members in all of those states. Uh, as I said, sort of our eyes and ears on the ground, uh, talking to community stakeholders, to bankers, local government, foundations, uh, and then reporting back uh, to headquarters where we uh, sort of dig into some of the more interesting emerging trends and issues and try to publish and research uh, those issues for more general consumption. So that's, that's sort of the origins of uh, sort of our work in our department. Uh, recently, 
we have been particularly interested in finding ways to harmonize people in place-based solutions. I think, as everybody in this room knows, uh, it's, it's not enough to physically rebuild a neighborhood. Uh, you have to invest in the people living in, in those neighborhoods as well to be successful. So I wanted to highlight a quote from Chairman Bernanke uh, that, that really makes that point. Uh, resilient communities require more than decent housing, important as that is. They require an array of amenities that support the social fabric of the community and build the capabilities of community residents. Uh, and I think this is particularly important. And I want to share some, some data points here. The community development industry has been active for roughly 40 or 50 years. Uh, sort of came out of the war on poverty. Uh, a lot of it is CRA motivated capital. So about $80 billion a year uh, flows from uh, CRA uh, motivated banks. Uh, and then of course, uh, there's roughly $20 billion a year of public subsidy uh, through the Long Income Housing Tax Credit Program, New Markets Tax Credit Program, Block Grant, Home Grant, et cetera. Uh, so all, all told, it's about $100 billion a year. Uh, we've made an, uh, enormous strides in rebuilding uh, significantly um, uh, disinvested uh, communities. We've built, just with the LIHTC program alone, about 3 million units of housing, which is a significant number. It's actually more than the total number of affordable housing units that, was, that were built um, by the federal government uh, since the New Deal uh, and the War on Poverty began, combined. So it's a significant achievement and something that the industry uh, uh, should, should take a, a great deal of credit for. The problem is that despite those wins, and there have been many wins, uh, we're still losing the war. And I think, as you can see from this trend line, uh, and it's a little bit out of date, it's a couple years out of date, it's, it's, that line has, has stabilized at about 15%. But what's worse is that if you go back in time, I think this starts at, at 2000, if you go back to the beginning of the war on, poor, on poverty, the poverty rate was roughly 15%. So, you know, that, that's an oversimplification. There's, there's obviously uh, income transfers that are uh, supporting a lot of people who are living at the poverty level, but I don't think that picture is, is one that, that, that we should be celebrating. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of work left to do, and uh, harmonizing people in place based strategies, in our mind, is, is one of the key, um, uh, the key paths forward. Uh, so this, this, unfortunately, masks the depth of the problem. And I don't mean to, I, I promise you there's an arc to this presentation where everybody will be happy at the end. <laughs> but I just wanted to share some statistics that I thought were, were particularly uh, germane to, to this presentation. Uh, as I mentioned before, the share of, of the population in poverty is, is uh, the, highest, the highest since 1993 and roughly uh, where it was in 1964 when the war on poverty began. The number of pov people in poverty is the highest on record. Uh, the share of children in poverty is the highest since 1993. Uh, the, sh the share of working aged adults is the highest since 1966. Uh, and this is particularly interesting for those of you who work uh, in suburban neighborhoods. Poverty is becoming more and more a suburban phenomenon. It's actually more of a suburban phenomenon than an urban phenomenon, which is a challenge for, for those of us who do this work because all of the services that we've built are located in our urban cores, uh, which means there's this uh, physical mismatch between where poor people live and the services that they require to, be, uh, to, uh, to, be, to lift themselves out of poverty. Uh, so that's, that is a trend that's worth keeping an eye on uh, going forward because it's, it's likely to increase going um, uh, into the future. So, so as I mentioned, uh, winning battles, losing the war, uh, the poverty statistics are somewhat sobering, but there's hope. So as I mentioned, uh, rebuilding communities, uh, the, the physical landscape of, of our neighborhoods is insufficient. It's necessary, but insufficient. Uh, the human capital piece is the key though. Uh, unfortunately, we're bumping up against a system that's been in place for decades uh, where most, most sources of funding, whether it's private or, or public, are oriented towards real estate development and not necessarily human capital development. So that's, that is a, a challenge of our own creation, unfortunately. So pay for success, and the way that I'd like to, to, to present it to all of you today, is our solution to that problem. 
It creates a financing mechanism, a funding mechanism to invest in human capital development alongside real estate development. Uh, so that's, that's the hope with, with pay for success financing. So this is uh, so the outline of, of my presentation. I would like to quickly take you through, uh, first of all, what is pay for success? I'd like to share some examples of pay for success with you. Um, I'd like to spend a little bit of time on social impact bonds. Can I get just a really quick show of hands? Who here has heard of social impact bonds? Okay, so for an educated audience. Uh, as all of you know, the first thing that you should know about social impact bonds is that they're not bonds. Uh, so I just want to really emphasize that point. It is a huge source of confusion. Uh, I blame the British for that. Uh, they were invented in the UK. Um, Bond in that context meant something slightly different. When they were imported across the Atlantic, something was lost in translation, and we've ended up with something that uh, is more confusing than helpful. Um, so the better way to think about social impact bonds are social impact loans, or if, if you will, social impact investments. Um, so they're not, they're not bonds. I'd like to take a moment and talk about uh, a, a proposed uh, social impact bond uh, example uh, that's oriented around uh, the Nurse Family Partnership and Early Childhood Intervention for Kids in uh, South Carolina, actually. Uh, then I'm going to pivot, spend a couple minutes uh, talking about some of the benefits as I see them of Pay for Success. Uh, I've just highlighted four uh, in this presentation. Uh, it's not an exhaustive list. Same with pitfalls. Uh, this is not a panacea. It doesn't solve all of our problems. Uh, I'd like to highlight, again, four uh, potential pitfalls that I see with pay for success, something to keep in mind if you're interested in this and, and decide to move forward with it. Uh, and then I'm going to close with a few thoughts on the role of philanthropy in pay for success transactions and social impact bonds uh, and what all of you uh, can do uh, to plug into this, this new market um, and, and help it grow. Uh, so what is pay for success? So at a very basic level, Pay for success, and I have an animation. <laughs> that, this exhausts my, anime, my PowerPoint skills, so <laughs> I have to tell you. Uh, so at its core, uh, pay for success is a financing structure to capture downstream government savings to fund upstream community investments. So the work that we do, the work that you do, generates savings that accrue or value. It's a better way to think about it, but, but you can think about it as savings that accrues to government, usually, not necessarily. It could accrue to some other uh, organization or institution. You can think about an insurance company, a health insurance company. If you can find a way to reduce hospital admissions among a target population, uh, say, asthmatic kids, uh, if you can reduce the number of, of kids with asthma that go to the hospital with asthma emergencies, that saves their health insurance company significant amounts, amounts of money. Uh, so it doesn't have to be government, it can be an insurance company, it can be a foundation. Uh, it, you, the better way to think about it is uh, where does the benefit accrue? And identifying that person as the payer, that organization as the payer in the transaction. Uh, just for simplicity's sake, uh, I've, I've uh, sort of focused in on government in this graphic. Obviously, it's more complicated than that. There are two main ingredients in pay for success contracts of all kinds. Uh, the first is a performance-based contract. Uh, so the, the best way to think about that is you have a nonprofit, usually, who agrees to uh, deliver some kind of outcome. Let's say that outcome is an increase in the high school graduation rate uh, in a low-income school. Uh, let's say it's a 50% it's a increase in the graduation rate over the course of five years. Uh, government uh, values that outcome, and they agree to pay that nonprofit $10 million if they actually pull it off and can deliver a 50% increase in the high school graduation rate over that, that predetermined period of time. Once that contract is in place, an independent impact auditor is brought into the transaction to certify uh, whether or not uh, that organization delivered the outcome that they promised contractually to deliver. Uh, that's a really important piece of any pay for success contract and the independence of that auditor is also important and something that I'd like to get into in, in the question and answer session after the presentation. And then again, just to emphasize the point, government only pays for success. If you fail to deliver that 50% increase in the graduation rate, you don't get anything. So the key 
to making this work because there's money at the end of the rainbow. There's that $10 million at the end of the rainbow. The key to making this work is that nonprofit has to go out into the world and raise private bridge financing. So to pay for their ongoing operations for that, for that five year period of the contract. So they, they will raise that, that, that private financing from uh, banks, foundations, philanthropists, impact investors, it doesn't matter. Um, the terms of that financing, this is, this is an oversimplification, but these are just three that I think are particularly important. Uh, the difficulty of achieving success is going to be a material factor. Uh, are we talking about increasing the graduation rate by 50% or 5%? That's going to affect the riskiness of the investment and the terms of the, of the financing. The track record of the service provider, of the nonprofit, is this, is this something that you've been doing for 10 years? Do you have an evidence-based model that you can share with me before I invest in your program? Or are you the new, new kid on the block with a great idea but ultimately untested? That's going to affect the, the terms of the financing. And then the length of the contract. What's the time horizon? Is it five years? Is it one year? Is it 18 years? Uh, that's going to, that's gonna, again, have a material effect on the financing. And then again, to emphasize the point, the investors bear the risk that the nonprofit will succeed or fail in delivering the outcome. If they do successfully de deliver the outcome, the government pays for that outcome, and the nonprofit uses that reward to pay back the investor plus a return. If the outcome isn't achieved, there's no money to pay back the investor, so the investor is, at, is exposed to potentially a full loss, um, which is why, as you'll see in, in some of these examples, um, and we can talk about this more, and, and particularly in the context of philanthropy's role, most of the deals so far have some form of credit enhancement associated with them because asking investors to be fully exposed to the downside risk uh, has been, up until this point, kind of a deal killer, a non-starter. Uh, so hopefully over time as the market matures, that need for credit enhancement will get smaller and smaller. Uh, but, but for now, uh, it's a significant piece of, uh, of any pay-for-success contract. So that's, that's sort of the basics of pay for success. So here are some examples. Some of these may be familiar, all of these may be familiar to you, uh, but they may not be familiar to you as pay for success uh, tools. So as you can see, I'm, I'm gonna spend a minute on prize-based philanthropy because I think it's, 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 a, it's a fun story and it's, it's a great example of how these kinds of tools can be used to um, encourage innovation in program delivery. Uh, who, who here has heard of the XPRIZE Foundation? Okay, so about, about half of you. So this is one of my favorite foundations. Uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, the XPRIZE Foundation agreed to pay the first private company uh, that could build a spaceship that would take two people to space and back twice in two weeks. Uh, that, that and back part is actually a late addition. People used to ask me about that. Uh, first company that could do this would get $10 million. Didn't matter what the, what the spaceship looked like, didn't matter what fuel it used, didn't matter uh, really you know, what the design of the spaceship was. Uh, all that mattered is that they met the goals of the, of the, um, of the program, of the prize. So eventually a Paul Allen uh, backed company won the prize and successfully sent uh, two people into space twice, uh, 100 kilometers above the earth and back successfully in two weeks. Um, but that's not the most interesting part of the story. The most interesting part of the story is that 27 companies spanning seven countries across the globe collectively spent $100 million innovating new space technology in an attempt to win that $10 million prize. So if you think about it from the XPRIZE Foundation's perspective, not only did they get a working spaceship for a mere $10 million, and if you're, I mean, we're talking a spaceship, that's pretty cheap. <laughs> they got a working spaceship, not the promise of a working spaceship, not a design of a spaceship that may or may not work. They got a working spaceship, and they got $100 million of new technological innovation which is now the basis of a $1.2 billion space tourism industry. So all, all it took was a $10 million prize, and they leveraged that into $100 million of innovation, uh, which is now uh, transforming the space industry. Why can't we do the same thing 
to solve social problems. So that, that's why I include this as a pay for success uh, example. Uh, just to, again, kind of reiterate the basic points. You've got private money bearing the risk at the beginning, and you've got a payout at the end. That's the case with, with the X Prize. It wasn't a government payout at the end, but there's, a, there's money at the end of the rainbow, and private, private investors bear the risk that you'll build it or not build it, uh, and if you get, get to space or not get to space. Uh, so th those are the key ingredients to, to, to pay for success. The Low Income Housing Tax Credit is a program I'm sure all of you are familiar with, but may maybe don't think of as a pay for success um, tool. It, it is slightly different. It's a, it's a slight adaptation of uh, the model that we've talked about, but it's th the, the concept is the same. You have private money coming in purchasing the, 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 the credits. That private money is used to build the housing. And then there's a performance contract, right? That housing needs to be affordable for 15 consecutive years. And if at any point in that 15 consecutive year period, that project becomes unaffordable, those credits are recaptured by the government at full loss to the investor. So the investor has a powerful incentive only to invest in projects where they have a great deal of certainty that they're going to be able to build something that will be appealing to people in that particular market and will be rented uh, at an affordable rate for 15 consecutive years. So instead of a payout at the end, there's a penalty, but the concept is the same. Tax increment financing, I won't spend any time on that, um, but as you all know, it's, 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 it's a tool to freeze property taxes at basically at the rates where they are currently in a depressed neighborhood, uh, and then the, the, in exchange for doing so, uh, the investors that come in to build the things that transform the neighborhood, uh, the tax, the property tax increment that results uh, is used to repay those investors for having borne the risk that those investments wouldn't necessarily increase the property tax rate. Um, just another example of private money in, public money out, uh, some period of time in between. Um, energy efficiency financing, this is, you know, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. Uh, you have a number of private companies who are going to be willing to come and build solar panels, install solar, solar panels on your roof uh, at no cost to you. And uh, in exchange for doing so, they get a share of the utilities savings that would otherwise accrue to you um, over the course of the next 10, 15, 20 years. And they use that as the basis for uh, funding the upfront investment to put the solar panels on your roof. Again, pay for success <laughs> contract. Human capital performance bond. Uh, this is an, a, a slight adaptation of the social impact bond. In this case, it actually is a bond, uh, structured slightly differently. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a program that was created in Minnesota. It has passed the uh, state legislature, but it has been unfunded up until this point, so we don't really know if it's going to work. Uh, but the basic concept is that the state will issue a bond. They'll take the proceeds of that bond, put it in a savings account, and then for every nonprofit that's eligible, that can bring a household to the state and prove that they have lifted that household out of a state of poverty to the point where they no longer require public assistance, which is quantifiable, the state will agree to take some of those savings, those are savings in, in food stamps, Medicaid, uh, public assistance, all, all of those programs, the state will agree to pay some portion of those savings that have accrued to the state and they will draw down from that savings account to do so. Uh, so it's a slightly different, different model. Uh, if you are unable to deliver a household uh, to the state and prove that you have taken them off of uh, public assistance, then you don't get paid. Uh, so it's, it's incentivizes uh, finding creative solutions to lifting people out of poverty. Uh, and then finally, the social impact bond. Uh, this is kind of the, the shiny new object these days. So this is, this is a slide that was prepared by Social Finance. Social Finance is one of two uh, national intermediaries uh, that put deals together. So they'll sit down with government, they'll negotiate terms with government, they'll negotiate terms with investors, service providers, uh, they provide technical assistance to uh, assemble these contracts. Uh, the other is an organization called uh, Third Sector Capital. So I encourage uh, you, if you're interested in these deals, to contact either uh, Social Finance US or Third Sector Capital Partners. Um, as you can see from this uh, fairly basic uh, illustration, and obviously these, these numbers are, are made up, you have a status quo. Uh, let's say that's uh, incarceration rates among at-risk youth, uh, just to borrow the, the, the New York example. 
uh, the Rikers Island example, that, that costs the government uh, $100. There is some kind of intervention. Uh, that maybe it's a behavioral therapy program, maybe it's a mentorship program, an after school program. Uh, that intervention costs $30. Uh, it's, it's not effective all the time, uh, which is reflected in that, that uh, continuing $40 cost to, to the public. Uh, but it is, in fact, effective 30% uh, uh, of the time. So uh, even with the cost of the intervention and the cost of uh, that intervention not working in all cases, there is public savings of $30 left over, which can be used to finance that, that bridge loan uh, that, that raises operating capital for the nonprofit providing the intervention. And just at, at a very basic level, as long as the bar on the left is bigger than the bar on the right, you have a financeable deal. There's an opportunity for a pay for success contract. So this is the structure of a social impact bond. Uh, for those of you who work with the low income housing tax credit, it will look very familiar to you. Uh, the basic concept is you have an intermediary. Uh, let's say that's, um, let's say that's purpose-built communities. Purpose-built communities uh, will sign a contract with government that says for every year that we can um, improve public safety in our neighborhood, government will send you $5 million. The intermediary then goes out into the world and raises operating funds from investors. The intermediary then uses those funds to subcontract with nonprofits who can deliver the services on the ground to deliver the outcome that the intermediary promised government it would deliver. In this case, a reduction in crime. Those nonprofits work with the populations in need. Some period of time goes by. An independent validator comes in and determines definitively, did you or did you not reduce the crime rate in the neighborhood that you're targeting? If you did, in fact, deliver uh, uh, that outcome, the government pays the intermediary uh, the $5 million that it was promised. The intermediary then uses that $5 million to repay the investors plus some kind of return reflecting the risk and the, the time value of money. So that's social impact bond. And I know uh, it, it can seem complicated, but it's not that different from the community. I mean, community development finance is about as complicated as it gets. Uh, so this is child's play for most of you who do this all the time. Uh, so I would just encourage you to, to don't, uh, uh, if, if you take anything away from this, this presentation, Hopefully, it's, it's, it's the, the, this has all been demystified to some extent. So that's the social impact bond. And I just wanted to walk you through a, a proposed social impact bond uh, that's, that's being considered right now. Uh, this, is, this is to improve childhood outcomes in South Carolina. I, I wanted to get a Georgia example, but this is as close as I could get. <laughs> so uh, childhood outcomes in South Carolina uh, are, are not good. South Carolina ranks 45th in overall child well-being, and they're consistently behind uh, in all four of these dimensions, economic well-being, health, education, and family and community. So the SIB proposal is to bring in nurse-family partnership, which targets low-income, first-time mothers, and provides them with home visitation and follow-up visits um, from pregnancy through age two. Home visitation pro programs have been shown, and they've actually done a number of studies on this, uh, to uh, reduce the number of premature babies and low birth weight babies, to improve child health and development, reduce child maltreatment, improve maternal self-sufficiency, and prepare children for kindergarten What's interesting and makes this a pay for success opportunity is that for every kid whose childhood is improved materially, that will save the state of, of South Carolina about $19,000 over the course of that child's first 18 years of life. Uh, those savings accrue to different budget lines uh, within the public budget, which is a, a significant challenge and I don't want to minimize that uh, and something that we should talk about in, in the Q&A session. Uh, but as you can see, the bulk of those savings accrue to Medicaid, uh, and the rest are, are spread fairly evenly um, between other public um, programs. 
So for every kid that you can lift out of po at, you can improve uh, their childhood outcome, you save the government $19,000. So this is a slide that I prepared just to illustrate how this transaction could actually work. This, this is a proposal by the Institute of uh, Child Success, uh, Institute for Child Success, excuse me. And they're proposing scaling up nurse, practici nurse family practitioners' uh, involvement in, in South Carolina to the tune of 2,750 uh, additional mothers entering into the system. Uh, the cost of that intervention, serving 2,750 uh, new mothers, is about $21 million. Uh, but the savings that accrue to government, again, over those first 18 years of, of life, uh, dwarf that. Uh, $52.6 million that accrues to government in terms of savings. Some money is set aside for an impact auditor and the intermediary, that's the third sector capital partner uh, group or the US, the, the, the social finance US uh, intermediary that I talked about before. Um, even after those costs are taken into account, there is a net savings to government of $28.6 million. Uh, just for illustration's sake, uh, I split that down the middle and assume that half of that would be used to pay back investors. Uh, and of course, this is on top of the principal that would already be returned to investors. And the remaining 50% uh, would be left to, uh, to government as savings to taxpayers or uh, money that can be reallocated to other programs. So as you can see, it's sort of a win-win-win. Uh, taxpayers are better off. Uh, obviously, more mothers are receiving uh, intensive care in, the, 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 uh, in their pregnancy. Uh, we have capital flowing to programs that are evidence-based and have proven outcomes. Um, and the nonprofit itself has a sustainable source of financing going forward. So it's a win-win-win when it all works. So I'm just going to pivot really quickly and highlight four of the benefits that I see of pay-for-success financing. Um, I mentioned one before that's innovation, and it's really important. I think that for those of us who work in the community development field, one of, and I, I don't in, intend to speak for everybody here, but um, I, I am frustrated by uh, what I see as a calcification of an industry that used to be extremely innovative and entrepreneurial. Uh, so I, I'm hopeful that these kinds of contracts and financing tools will shake some of that calcification loose and allow organizations working on the ground uh, to try new things and experiment and rapidly prototype. Uh, so that's that the innovation piece is one that's not on this list, but worth uh, mentioning again. One of the benefits of pay for success contracts is it solves the, or can solve, and I'm, I don't want to minimize how complicated it's going to be to work with government uh, with these contracts, but it potentially solves the wrong pocket problem. Right? You've got uh, a, a HUD financed affordable housing project uh, that serves chronically homeless people those chronically homeless people move into the project, uh, into the building, and one of the benefits of that move is they no longer go to the emergency room suffering from exposure uh, as often as they used to. Those savings accrue to the public health department, or the county hospital, or to HHS, or to Medicaid, uh, or to Medicare. And there's no ability currently to capture those savings and use them to build more supportive housing to house more chronically homeless people, which would then generate uh, more savings to government going forward. So pay for success contracts potentially solve that wrong pocket problem, uh, which, is a, which is a real innovation in the field. They promote evidence-based policy. This is a priority uh, at the federal government level. I'm sure a lot of you have, have heard this, this before. Um, it's shocking to me, maybe not completely shocking, but still shocking that I, I, I think I read recently that only 3% of our federal programs are actually evaluated for effectiveness, which means that 97% aren't. Uh, so this is a movement uh, at the federal level to uh, embrace uh, programs that are evidence-based, that we can track over time, and potentially uh, use that information to reallocate resources or encourage uh, organizations to change to be more effective going forward. Pay for success will radically um, move this agenda forward. Uh, the, the evidence piece, the data piece, 
did you or did you not succeed, is part of any pay for success contract. So for each pay for success contract that's signed, uh, we will be moving one step, one step closer to an evidence-based policy paradigm. Uh, so it's a really powerful contribution uh, to, this, to this particular movement. Um, and again, government only pays for what works instead of uh, paying for what it's paid for in the past, which is a pretty big uh, shift. Uh, and it moves us um, away from inputs, outputs, and towards outcomes. If you think about what do we really care about? We, re we care about reducing poverty in a, in a neighborhood. Well, we should pay for that. We shouldn't pay for programs that may or may not produce that. And this is, this is, this is one of the primary goals of pay for success contracting. Um, and, and again, is moving the evidence-based policy agenda forward. It builds on the success of the existing public-private uh, investment model. This is something that the community development finance uh, industry deserves an enormous amount of credit for. It's something that, that um, all of you do every day. And I believe that pay for success financing and these tools are a perfect fit for the kind of financial uh, acumen that you must have in the community development field uh, to cobble together public and private philanthropic sources of capital to create innovative capital stacks to, to pull off complicated uh, uh, traditionally real estate uh, projects in low-income communities. That acumen, uh, I think, will lend itself very well to pay for success contracting and social impact bonds. Uh, finally, they support holistic community development. This is something that, that um, is just um, beginning to, I think, um, enter into the, the discussion about how pay for success contracts and social impact bonds can be used. As all of you know, there uh, are a lot of resources to fund, uh, relatively speaking, to fund programs and real estate developments and transactions. Um, but one of the things that, that we have come to appreciate over the course of the last 30 or 40 years working in the field is that there needs to be a, a coordination component to that. Uh, it's not enough to uh, just drop community development services out of a helicopter and expect that to result in any meaningful change in the poverty rate in that community. There needs to be uh, some kind of neighborhood level coordination. That can be a single institution. That can be uh, a, a group, uh, the, the, the collective action sort of approach, a group of community stakeholders who come together and agree on what are the goals of our community and how are we going to achieve them. Um, but ultimately, more coordination. There are no funding sources, or very few, to support that kind of coordination. These contracts pro provide an opportunity to uh, lead agencies, to community quarterbacks, as we like to call them, to sign contracts with government where the government pays the lead agency for achieving some kind of big outcome, like reducing the poverty rate in their neighborhood, or reducing the childhood obesity rate, or reducing the type 2 diabetes rate, or increasing education outcomes, or reducing the incidence of, of violent crime. Government can sign a contract with the lead agency that says we will pay you for delivering those stretch outcomes, and it's up to you to figure out how to do it. And you need to go out into the world, and raise your own financing on the basis of this future commitment to pay for your experimentation. And if you succeed, uh, there is a reward waiting for you at the end of the rainbow. So I, I see this as, as a real opportunity to support holistic, coordinated community development uh, and, and really a, an opportunity to fill that, that funding gap that currently exists. So those are some of the benefits. As I mentioned before, pay for success is not a panacea. It's, uh, I think it has a lot of potential to uh, move our uh, industry forward in a positive way, but there are some serious concerns associated with it. I've highlighted four here. This is not an exhaustive list. Uh, first is, is the data question. The legitimacy of the data, how it's collected, who collects it, who certifies it, uh, that, is, that is a huge issue. Uh, it, think about these contracts. You're talking about multi-million dollar contracts. And if you can't agree, if you can't get all parties involved to agree on whether success has been achieved or not, then the contracts fall apart. So that, that is a huge, huge part of this. We have to get our data house in order first before we can use pay for success contracts and social impact bonds at scale in the future. Uh, so that's, that's a big piece. 
a lot of people are, are excited about social impact bonds and pay for success contracts because they see them as an opportunity to um, govern more efficient, efficiently, to save money in the prison system and spend that money elsewhere or send it back to taxpayers. So it's, 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 a, it's a fiscal tool, um, a public fiscal tool. And I think that's right to a certain extent, but I don't think we should uh, be too uh, stringent about connecting the payment, the reward, to actual savings. Because in a lot of cases, and in, in this slide I, I use the, the prison example to illustrate it, in a lot of cases, you may improve uh, whatever government service is being meted out. You may reduce the prison population, but until you do that to such a degree that you can close a prison, you're not going to be able to extract savings out of the, the Department of Corrections. And compounding that challenge is one man's savings is another man's job. So how confident are we that government is going to lay off public prison guard union members, cut their pension contributions and their, and their health care contributions? That's how the savings gets generated. But is there political will to actually do that? Is that the responsible thing to do? Uh, those are all really important questions. And if we are too stringent, again, about connecting the payment to the savings, we're going to end up in a situation where the savings don't materialize and the government backs out because they don't perceive any value uh, for having uh, uh, received, paid for that successful outcome. Um, so that, that is, a, that is a, uh, an issue that that's, uh, has yet to be resolved. We'll see how it plays out as these contracts become more common. Government capacity and appropriations risk. This is asking government staff to uh, procure social services in a completely new way. So it's going to require significant uh, education and technical assistance of public agency staff for this to work. Uh, so that's a significant risk. And then the appropriations challenge. If you sign a contract with a legislature today and the legislature says, sure, we'll pay you $10 million in 10 years if you increase the graduation rate by 50%. 10 years go by, you deliver the outcome. But there's a new legislature and there's a new governor. And they say, you know, we, we don't really care. <laughs> we want to spend that $10 million on something else. Thanks for your service, now go on your way. And that's a very real possibility. Uh, states, in a lot of cases, are constitutionally, in all cases, are constitutionally entitled to default on contracts like this. And it may or may not affect their, their credit rating. So if these are going to work, there needs to be some kind of, of workaround solution to that challenge. Whether it's the, the legislature setting aside some portion of the payout every year until you get to year 10 and there you've got a, a pot of money that you can draw from. Whether it's passing special legislation that would directly tie uh, the credit uh, rating of the state to whether or not it actually executed its obligations uh, as described in, in the contract. That's what the state of Massachusetts has done. Um, but as you can imagine, that's probably uncommon. It's going to be hard to get legislatures to commit to that kind of um, direct tie between the state's uh, credit rating and these particular contracts. Um, but the larger point is that investors are going to have a hard enough time underwriting the quality of the nonprofit and pricing that risk if they also have to underwrite the appropriations risk of the government that they're contracting with these deals are never going to get off the ground so that's that's a big a big issue that's worth keeping in mind if you move forward with these these contracts and then finally and I think this is important uh, to, to highlight there are ethical considerations you can imagine a scenario where, and I don't, I don't mean to be overly dramatic, but you can imagine a scenario where you have a nonprofit that provides um, in-home treatment, healthcare treatment, to the frail el elderly. Uh, and the contract is tied to reducing 
the rate of hospital admissions for that particular popula population of seniors. And if I do that for every, every senior citizen, then I, I can keep out of the hospital, which is, which is a good thing. We want to keep them in their homes and healthy and not needing emergency care. For every person that I can keep out of the hospital, the government or an insurance company or a hospital agrees to pay me $20,000, reflecting a portion of the savings that would accrue to that, that agency or, or, or company um, because that person didn't go to the emergency room. My solution to accomplishing this goal is to chain those people to their beds so they can't go to the hospital. They may need to go to the hospital, but they can't go to the hospital. Either way, I get my $10,000. So we need to be very careful about how these contracts are structured to, uh, to the extent possible, uh, protect those vulnerable populations from predators who would otherwise take advantage of these contracts and use them as a way to exploit them. Uh, and, and particularly since these are, for the most part, government contracts, uh, this is government shifting responsibility for caring for those communities onto the private sector. Uh, so government should be very careful about how uh, that work is done. And I believe these contracts should be uh, heavily regulated as a result. And what is allowed and not allowed should be spelled out very clearly in the contract itself so you don't see the kind of perverse outcomes uh, that I just described. And then finally, the other ethical consideration that's worth taking in, into account is there, there's, a, there's a reason that up until this point, most of uh, the, the attention um, that's being paid to social impact bonds and most of the deals that are coming together uh, are focused on recidivism, reducing the number of people who reoffend and go back to prison. That in and of itself, of course, is a great goal, but the real reason, well, there's two real reasons that, that these contracts are coming together um, disproportionately around recidivism and not other social challenges. Uh, one is, it's relatively easy to measure. You're either in prison or you're not in prison. So that solves that, that measurement question to some extent. It's obviously not that simple, but it's, it's a relatively binary measure. Uh, and the other is you save a ton of money. It costs $60,000 to incarcerate somebody in the state of California. It costs almost $200,000 to incarcerate a youth in the city of New York. So you can send one of those kids to Harvard for what it costs to incarcerate them for one year. So a lot of governments are seeing this low-hanging fruit and they're going after it uh, with sort of a gold rush mentality. And I think that's a mistake. Um, I think those programs are fine. But the first question should be what problems are most important to us and then the second question is, how can we use these contracts to solve those problems, not the other way around? It shouldn't be, find the source of, of the, the most inefficiency, and we will build contracts around that inefficiency. Uh, so it's, it's a question of values, it's a question of priorities. Uh, and I, I'm concerned that these contracts are only going to be used uh, in cases where the savings are so large that government uh, rushes to find some kind of solution to generate those savings, not necessarily because it's motivated to solve the particular needs of that target population. So those are some, some ethical considerations that are worth taking into account. And then finally, I just wanted to end on this. And I know that not everybody in the room is uh, from the, the philanthropic sector, and I apologize um, for that. But here are four ways that, that foundations and, and uh, people working in philanthropy can, can engage pay for success contracts. The first is, as I mentioned before, to, to credit enhance these deals. The Rikers Island uh, deal that was signed last November um, was a $9.2 million Goldman Sachs investment, which, which is great, but it was backstopped by a $8 million loan guarantee by Bloomberg Philanthropies. So significant credit enhancement. And Goldman Sachs will tell you that they would not have done the deal without that credit enhancement. So it's a really important piece. As I mentioned earlier in my presentation, I'm hoping that as the risks are better understood and this market matures, there will be less need for that credit enhancement. Obviously, those dollars can be better spent on other things than backstopping Goldman Sachs. Uh, but for now, it's, it's a critical component of, of these contracts. This is, this is something that, that I don't think philanthropies necessarily think about when they think about social impact bonds. 
but you yourselves can be the payer. It doesn't have to be government. I think government is the ultimate goal because the resources available to government are so much larger than the resources available to the philanthropic community. But if you value a particular, a, a particular outcome, like, as I mentioned before, reducing the number of kids in Fresno that go to the emergency room with asthma emergencies, if that is something, if, if that is the mission of your foundation to accomplish that goal, then maybe you should be the payer. Maybe you should agree, you should enter into a contract with a service provider that can deliver that outcome and agree to pay them $10,000 per kid that stays out of the hospital. And then on the basis of that commitment, the nonprofit would go out into the, into the, the capital markets and raise financing from banks and other foundations and impact investors. But you could be the payer. It doesn't have to be government. The bridge financing piece, I think, is a more natural fit for a lot of foundations, particularly foundations that uh, do program-related investments. So you can provide that, 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 that bridge capital that, that funds the ongoing operations of the service provider for the duration of the contract. And you can probably do it uh, on better terms than Goldman Sachs. So if this is something that you're interested in, I would encourage you to find deals that uh, are consistent with your mission and then find a way to structure a PRI that provides that bridge capital uh, to support uh, the, the, the service provider. And then finally, this is all really new. Despite the fact that I, I listed a few examples of pay for success, as it's manifesting in the social impact bond uh, and other new uh, ways of, of performance-based contracting, nobody really knows how this is gonna play out. Nobody really knows what the appropriate risk pricing is gonna be for these deals. And, and as an illustration, um, I would just mention that um, with the low-income housing tax credit, it's useful to remember in 1986 when the credit was created that credit sold for about 46 cents on the dollar. And today they sell for 95 cents on the dollar. And in California they sell for $1.05 at an economic loss because the bank investors are getting CRA credit. But the point is that when the program was created, there was a great deal of uncertainty. Nobody knew if this was a safe investment. They had no ability to, to price it accurately. But over the course of the last 20 years, 25 years, that risk has been better understood, which allows investors to better price, price it, uh, which has raised the price of the credits, which obviously raises more private capital to build affordable housing. So I'm hopeful that social impact bonds pay for success contracts follow a similar trajectory, where at first you're gonna see some wacky numbers, where investors are requiring significant returns to get into the, into the game, or significant credit enhancement. But as the risks are better understood, as service providers are doing what they're doing, doing for a long period of time uh, and have a consistent track record, then I suspect that the terms will improve dramatically. Um, so one of the things that, that, that philanthropy can do is help build that, um, that literature. We need to understand what's working and what's not working, what it cost, how the deals came together, and that's something that, that philanthropy can support, can document, can publish on. And then also, most of these deals start with a feasibility study. So before you know that you have a deal, you do a study. You look at the service provider, you look at their track record, you estimate their effectiveness, you estimate the cost savings that accrue, you determine where those cost savings uh, accrue to, and then you write that up as a report, and that becomes the basis for the start of a negotiation of a pay for success contract. In most cases, paying for that feasibility study is going to be philanthropy. So to some extent, you guys are sort of the key, sort of first mover on these deals. Uh, and so if you feel like there's an opportunity to pull a pay for success contract together in a community that you care about, uh, I would start there. I would start with a feasibility study. So, those are just a, a few suggestions on potential roles for philanthropy. But that's, that's the end of my prepared remarks. Um, very much looking forward to the Q&A. It's always the most interesting part of this. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Appreciate it. Right, uh, so that's two, two, two questions in there. Uh, one, one is sort of how do you 
structure these deals, if you're a philanthropy, uh, you're, you're trying to get a sense of what, what, what are the grant making opportunities, what happens to the grants if you don't hit the targets. Um, the first thing to remember is if you've seen one social impact bond, you've seen one social impact bond. And all of these deals, all of these, these contracts are going to look different uh, depending upon the geography, depending upon the, the service provider, the government that's involved, uh, the, the time horizon of the investment, so, and, the, and, the, and the roles that the various partners in the deal are going to play. In some cases, the foundation is going to play uh, maybe a, f a, a forgivable grant <coughs> role. Uh, maybe the, the philanthropy is going to play a credit enhancement role. Maybe a, a PRI expectation that you pay us back with interest role, and maybe as a, as a payer. Uh, so your question about um, how do you structure these, these grants, so, and, the, and the te that's the second question. Uh, so, so you can structure the, gr the grants as an investment, as a, as a forgivable loan, however, you, however it makes sense given the, the circumstances of the particular contract. On the tax credit side, I, uh, Carol mentioned that I'd written a paper a few years ago called the uh, Charter School Tax Credit. Uh, in investing in human capital. I proposed a model like that, which was to adapt the LITEC program and use it to raise funds for education programs uh, that uh, work with low-income charter schools. And there would be, there'd be performance targets associated with it, and, and there'd be a similar recapture provision. Uh, that didn't really go anywhere, so I don't know if there is a lot of interest in turning this model into an investment tax credit. Um, but I think it, it would solve one significant challenge, and that is the <coughs> appropriations risk challenge. One of the reasons that the low income housing tax credit continues to persist beyond the fact that it's, it's a very successful program on its face is that it's a tax expenditure. It doesn't go up for an appropriations vote every year. So you don't have politicians fighting over whether it makes sense uh, every year. It just, it's part of the tax code, and it gets re-upped periodically, uh, and otherwise it gets left alone. And I think if you could give social impact bonds a similar treatment where, sure, you, know, you, have, you have a political battle the first time, but then once it's in the tax code, you forget about it. And investors, instead of receiving an appropriation, a, 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 you know, a check in the mail, receive a reduction in their tax liability, uh, which is functionally equivalent. That may be a good way to go. Um, but as far as I know, nobody has, has proposed making a social impact bond a tax expenditure as opposed to a direct appropriation. But great question. Absolutely. Uh, and I think that's going to significantly improve the, the investment terms and the willingness of investors to come to the table. If they know that if they can hit some intermediate benchmarks, they'll get a small payout every year you know, for 10 years, and then maybe there's a balloon, balloon payment at the end. I think that, that investors and service providers should be engaged in constant communication throughout the life of the contract so that investors' interests are protected. And if, if there is some perceived uh, lack of effectiveness, you can get that information quickly and act on it. Uh, so that's something that should happen regardless of how the contract is structured. The only problem with, with sort of um, uh, payouts over time is that if you're contracting with a government that doesn't see savings, until the end of that contract. Uh, let's say it's, it's reducing uh, incarceration rates and the intervention is um, early childhood education, which we know is directly tied to incarceration rates. That's an 18 year time horizon. So the government doesn't see a dime of those savings until year 18 or later. And they may not be willing to uh, essentially full advance you the savings uh, on an annual basis because uh, they are concerned that perhaps those savings will never accrue uh, or they may accrue differently than they expected and all of a sudden you've taken all their money and run. Uh, so there's going to be some pushback there from government but assuming you can get a government uh, partner to the table who's willing to pay out that reward over the course of the life of the contract assuming you hit certain benchmarks, I think that's a superior way of contracting. I think that's the key uh, to, to bringing this tool to, to, to scale, uh, because you're right, benefits tend to be, tend to sort of disperse throughout multiple budget uh, areas and, and multiple levels of government. 
Uh, so it can be they, those benefits can accrue to the city, to the county, to the to the state, and to the federal government. Um, there is a deal that is closing in Massachusetts, uh, where the payer is actually a group of uh, uh, partners. Uh, big big um, portion of this of the payment will come from um, government, from the state, um, but then there are uh, actually some philanthropies involved who will also be contributing uh, to, to, to the pay it, payment. And interestingly, the organization itself, the service provider, is uh, using some of the payout that's committed uh, that would go to it as a reward. And they're putting that up as collateral uh, to send a signal that they're highly confident that they're going to be able to deliver the outcome. So in a, in a strange way, the organization itself is part of the payment structure. Uh, so you're going to see, I think, a lot of these hybrid models. I would love to see government agencies at different levels of government entering into some kind of arrangement where they pay their pro rata share of whatever the savings are. Um, but that requires long-term government vision. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm nervous that there are so many <coughs> institutional barriers uh, in place that it will be very, very difficult to pull that off um, on, on any more than a one-off basis. But that, that is the path forward. That's, that's where we need to get. I'm not sure how we get there, um, but if we can get government to actually work with itself better and be the payer, uh, then these contracts will be, I think, much more successful. That's a very fair question. The way that I try to change the discussion when this comes up, uh, not to avoid the question, but uh, <laughs> to sort of, I think, I think force us to think differently about what the payment means. So I think most of the people that, that are excited about social impact bonds and pay for success contracts uh, see the payment as this representation of future costs averted. And I think that's, that's not right. I think the better way to look at the payment is the, the financial value of the outcome, the value of the outcome to government. Now, a lot of factors can contribute to that value. Part of that value can be attributed to uh, predicted cost savings. Uh, that, that can certainly inform my decision as government of what I'm willing to pay for any given outcome. But I also want to see a healthier society. I value that. And I don't know what, what that, the dollar value of that is, if I'm a particular government, but there is one. And that should contribute to that decision about what the payment ought to be, um, as well as having a more economically productive workforce. That's valuable to me. I can add that into, into the mix, into the calculus. And the number that gets spit out is the payment. And it may or may not reflect the cost savings at all. Um, it's, that's just one of the factors that went into that determination. So my hope is that 10, 20 years from now when Dateline comes around, is that that's the story that we tell. Is that you purchased something that's hard to quantify in cost savings alone. But we should be happy about that because it's tied to something that's easily understood as having contributed value to government. So you're right. We may not have saved money, but the prison population is going to be lower, and the number of kids graduating from high school is going to be higher, and the number of kids who go to the emergency room with asthma attacks is going to be lower. Those are things, those will be real accomplishments if these contracts work. And so even if we may not be able to make a case on the, on the saving side, there's a really powerful case to be made on the impact side. Uh, so for me, that's, that's the more important question. Uh, and again, why I've, I've encouraged people to think more broadly about value and how that factors in into the payment decision. Unfortunately, the former tends to be significantly more than the latter. Uh, I wish that the marginal costs were, well, I don't wish that they were higher, but if they were higher, it would make this case a lot easier, right? Because every person you keep out of, the, out of prison saves you know, a, a significant amount of money. But one of the keys, and one of the things that I failed to mention, and it's important, uh, and this is part of this, that conversation about evidence-based policy, is in almost every case uh, where one of these social impact bonds is, is, is closing or is, is being developed, 
there is a randomized control, tri control trial element to it. So it's not enough to prove that you have positively impacted the population that you're working with. It's did you positively impact them more than you would have yeah. absent your intervention. And that's really important. And there are a lot of cases where we have patted ourselves on the back for uh, some successful outcome that was delivered by a nonprofit when if you go back and you actually look at the numbers and you compare that population to a similar popula population, you realize actually it was because the, the economy improved or because some public policy changed, which affected all communities equally. That's a great question. Uh, the first, the, the quick answer to that question is collect as much data as you possibly can as fast as possible. And I know that's hard and I know it's expensive and I know it's sort of beyond the scope of, of your day-to-day -day work, uh, but it's worth, I mean, in my opinion, you know, I don't have to pay their salary, but it's worth hiring somebody that focuses on this as their full-time job because there will be a moment where, where an opportunity arises and you're approached by government or you have an opportunity to approach government and demonstrate your value proposition in economic terms. And if you're not prepared to do that, somebody else will. So I'd say the, the quick answer is more data as quickly as possible. Um, it, again, to the extent that you can tie that impact to some public budget, that will also benefit you. Uh, if you can walk into the Department of Health and Human Services and say, our intervention is going to reduce Medicaid claims by 15% in this target population and that's going to save you this amount of money, that empowers you uh, to get better terms and, and, and bring government to the table where otherwise they'd probably sort of blow you off. Um, so I'd, I'd encourage you to the extent possible to, to at least estimate those cost savings. Um, and then finally, the earlier you can get government into the mix, into the conversation, even if you're just proving your concept and you're, not even, you're years away from a contract, if you can get a government official in the office with you, doing a walkthrough of your program, understanding the value that you create, and you're preparing them, you're priming them for that conversation that's going to happen in a year or two, uh, where they come to the table and agree to start paying you for that outcome, I think that would be very, very helpful. Uh, the sooner you can engage government, don't wait until the last minute and expect them to be excited about your program. Uh, bring them along for the ride and prove your program's effectiveness over, over time. Well, I think the long lasting tax credit is a great model for how banks could participate in a pay for success contract like a social impact bond. Um, and there's an, act, there's an obvious role for banks to, to sort of plug into that model and low income housing tax credits get CRA credit. Um, the one subject that I definitely can't talk about is whether social impact bonds will get CRA credit. Uh, part, of, part of the reason I can't talk about it is I don't know the answer. And the other part is because it's way above my pay grade. And I would get in trouble if I did. Uh, so I believe that Goldman Sachs, for example, is uh, moving into this market as aggressively as they are because they hope to get CRA credit going forward. Um, but again, I don't know if that's actually going to happen. Um, but given the history of the low income housing tax credit and the way that it's structured relative to these deals, um, I can certainly see a bank role. Um, whether that gets CRA credit or not is an open question. You know, it's been really sort of random so far. Um, there's only been two deals that have closed in the United States. One is the Rikers Island deal in New York. The other is um, uh, a special education intervention in the state of Utah. In, in the case of, of the New York deal, uh, that really was a, a one-off. Every aspect of that deal is not replicable. Uh, I mean, starting with the fact that just about every party in the deal is Michael Bloomberg, <laughs> that's not replicable. Um, so that deal really started because I think the Bloomberg administration was, was excited about this concept and wanted to prove the concept. And because the, Michael Bloomberg has a foundation and he has uh, contacts in the banking community and uh, you know, contacts in, in uh, you know, the, the, the nonprofit community. He was able to almost single-handedly, and I, I, I don't know that it was him in the room, but, but his administration was, was capable of pulling the whole thing together um, and being the driving factor for, for that contract being signed. In, in Utah, I think most of the, the, the motivation, most of the momentum came from the United Way. Uh, so this was, you know, a community stakeholder 
They're, they identified the fact that um, too many kids in the state of Utah were being tracked into special education. Uh, even though they didn't have uh, any particular learning disability, it was purely because they were showing up to school not prepared to learn. And that is a really expensive answer to a, a problem that has a much easier solution, and that is early childhood education to make sure that that achievement gap is closed before kids get to school. Um, so in that case, it was a community stakeholder, I think, that was, was sort of driving the, driving the train. Um, but going forward, it's, it's going to be interesting. It, I, I don't know. Uh, if it's going to be, if it's going to be government saying, you know, my my long-term uh, incarceration, uh, my my criminal justice costs are unsustainable, and we need to find a solution to that. Therefore, I'm going to call up third sector capital partners and ask them to find an evidence-based program that reduces the incarceration rate over time, and on the basis of that, we're going to put a contract together, or whether it's going to be a a particularly aggressive nonprofit that knows that it has an evidence-based program that knocks on every politician's door until they find somebody that listens to them and, and is convinced by their value proposition. Um, and then they sit down and they work out the numbers. So I don't know, it's, it's gonna be interesting to see how that plays out, but it's, a great, it's something that I think about a lot and I'm curious. So that's a fantastic question and also something that I've thought a lot about. And my, my first, reaction to it is, is the same phenomenon is present with low-income housing tax credit transactions. Uh, there are a number of layers of intermediaries, for those of you who have put those deals together, whether it's the syndicator, whether it's uh, the consultants, the developer, all of them, all those costs get layered on to a LIHTC deal compared to HUD just building housing. But that doesn't completely, that's not the whole picture. And the reason that I'm more comfortable with those additional transaction costs, both in the case of LIHTC and also in the case of social impact bonds and pay for success contracts, is not necessarily because we're increasing the pie, which we, we hope we're doing, but not necessarily, we may not increase the pie. Um, it's that that additional cost is the premium you pay to be guaranteed success. So right now, we have no guarantee that any particular intervention is actually going to work. And so that failure cost is hidden. So we're moving to a model where we pay for success and the cost of guaranteeing success is whatever that marginal increase in, in whatever the service is to, to uh, engage the kids or, or, or keep people out of prison. Uh, and that's, so to me, that's, that's a trade-off I'm willing to make because it gets us out of a model where we do things, hope for the best, and don't even know necessarily when we've failed. Uh, and that may be a cheaper model. Um, but it moves us to an evidence-based, success-based, outcomes-based model where we pay a little bit more, but we're guaranteed uh, the thing that we, that we want uh, and, and we're willing to pay for that. So I, that's something that, that's a great question and it's gonna come up a lot because people are gonna see that additional cost and it's gonna concern them. Ian, thank you. Thank you.